Hi, this is Kevin from the Mathsaurus, and in this video we're going to be asking how has COVID changed the classroom? Now, most of my YouTube channel is about school level maths, and whilst a lot of what I'm going to say here relates uh, as much to uh, school learning as university learning, this talk was actually prepared for uh, a conference at the University of Bath where most of the audience were academics or PhD students, so it is aimed a little more towards university teaching than my usual content. For those of you that don't know, this is actually my main occupation at the moment. After teaching for seven years in schools in London, um, I decided to come to, univer to the University of Bath uh, and do a PhD as part of the uh, SAMBA uh, Doctoral Training Centre. That stands for Statistical Applied Mathematics at Bath. And if you're thinking of doing a PhD, it's a very innovative programme where uh, alongside the PhD you get to participate in these think tanks where we formulate research problems with industrial partners. Um, they've taken me on teaching and research trips to Paraguay and Mongolia and it's also a super friendly place with a lot of great academics and students. They're not sponsoring this video, I uh, should say. So do check uh, that out if you're interested and uh, share it with anyone who might be. Um, I think we've got funding for 10 or 15 students a year for the next few years at least, um, but do check the official website uh, for all the details. Anyway, let me get on with the rest of this talk. So online education isn't new, uh, but has been growing over the last decade through services uh, like Coursera, Udemy, and even here on YouTube. Uh, so whilst COVID has certainly made the issue urgent, it's hard to see how this experiment could have come even close to working if the pandemic had occurred 10 years ago. We also have a context where a lot, but not all of the world, uh, has fairly reliable high-speed internet and where there are many edtech businesses out there whose offerings are really maturing into uh, excellent uh, products that uh, are starting to compete with some of the courses uh, being delivered in universities. So at the same time, tuition fees in the UK have been normalised and students are increasingly questioning the value for money that traditional university courses offer and are comparing them to innovative new universities, both physical and online. And that's leading to a much greater expectation of a polished student experience and professionalised content uh, as part of the service. You know, we're also a lot more conscious uh, of issues to do with access, outreach, diversity and inclusion. And I think actually this area could merit a whole talk in itself, although I'm going to keep it reasonably brief in this one. So I'll just touch on some of the opportunities and challenges that have arisen in this area through online teaching as well. So for those of you that don't know me, over the last five years or so I've been making educational videos here on YouTube as well, and uh, those started when I experimented with a flipped classroom as a secondary school teacher, and uh, you know today the Mathsaurus YouTube channel that you're watching this video on has had you know two million views across hundreds of videos, mostly GCSE and A-level, but also helping students prepare for things like the Oxford Maths Admissions Test and the Cambridge STEP exams. So if you are new to this channel, um, please do take a look at those and share them uh, with anyone you think might be interested. Um, I've also taught students uh, online in private tuition for several years and I'm not going to talk about that uh, in this video but if you're interested a few months ago I did also make another video about some of the more practical aspects of teaching online that's been pretty popular and so it's kind of a follow-up to that too and I'll put a link to that video uh, in the description below. So uh, an experiment rolled out at this sort of pace was never going to be perfect and there certainly have been a lot of uh, challenges with the move to online delivery. Some of them I think might be inherent to online teaching, but others perhaps just a result of the particular circumstances of 2020 and the rush to get everything sorted. I don't think we've yet found a great way of replicating the sort of informal discussions and social contact that we get on campus or at conferences, for example. Um, I think it has resulted in heavy workloads for a lot of teaching staff as they get used to new technologies very quickly and try to do the best they can for their students whilst their own lives have also often been very disrupted. Um, I've also heard a lot of discussion about the lack of engagement from students online. Are the students even there? Why don't they talk? And of course, you know, some students might be accessing the content in environments where they can't easily turn on their camera or microphone, uh, or perhaps they're in different time zones where the attending live is difficult. Uh, but arguably, these problems are also problems of the traditional classroom. Sometimes students don't turn up to your physical lectures, and mostly they say nothing when they do. And I think there's a lot of challenges around online assessment and how we deal with that too. And uh, there'll be a lot of other things that I haven't thought of um, or just haven't got time to discuss in the, in the length of video I want to make here. But please put things in the comments below if you've got other ideas and thoughts uh, uh, about this. I'd love to hear about them. But really, what I want to say and the focus of this video really is that there have also been some great positives um, that we should be looking to take forward too. Uh, and for example, some students with special educational needs, I'm thinking about autism in particular perhaps, have been getting on very well in online classes and perhaps even becoming you know, slightly anxious about having to return to normal. Uh, physical access requirements uh, haven't existed in the same ways for some groups who have access requirements and 
you know, the available availability of online content might also have helped some students with families or who have, you know, other sort of uh, flexible working requirements. Um, I do think we do need to be super careful here, though, to acknowledge that there are some groups it hasn't worked well for at all, too, and we should be very cautious about inadvertently creating a second class experience for students with access requirements rather than solving them in a better way. But I do hope that we can learn something here about providing high quality options in addition uh, for those who might benefit from them. And the other perhaps unexpected positive is the way in which the whole community, uh, at least in the university uh, in Bath here as I've seen, um, you know, has become focused on teaching and learning online and how to do it well. And an interesting part of the discussions that I've been involved in is that a lot of the time when we talk about you know good online teaching we're actually really just talking about good teaching and once the technical requirements have been met to teach online um, you know I really think that you know these uh, discussions and how we're thinking about learning and engagement with students can really create a sort of space for reflective practice and discussions of pedagogy that's sometimes um, harder to find than it should be in in, in university teaching at least. Um, I actually don't think recording all classes is a good idea at all, by the way. Um, uh, but, but I do think there is an idea in coaching that uh, sometimes when you just tell people how to do things and keep telling them what they're doing wrong, that they don't improve that much or they you know, even react negatively to it. Uh, but you know, somehow if you provide people with the tools to reflect on their own practice and to observe other people doing things differently, they often make a lot of progress without direct intervention. So the availability of recordings of yourself and of other people does seem to generate a certain self-reflection in this regard. So, you know, I mean, I, I'll be the first to say that I, you know, I often cringe watching my own YouTube videos uh, back, but you know, even as someone who's been a bit resistant to traditional sort of training programs in teaching, you know, it's hard not to at least try to learn from your own mistakes when they're, when they're played right back to you. So perhaps that has been a positive there as well, at least uh, when those things are managed correctly. Okay, so um, I don't want to make this video too long and in the original talk I gave at Bath I had a very strict time limit, um, so I'm keeping this as short as that hopefully, but I do think I want to try to provide some suggestions uh, about where this goes next rather than simply a sort of critique and an assessment, so let's have a look at a few of the ways that teaching might or maybe could progress as we move into the 2020s and 30s. So as I've said, you know, even before uh, COVID came around, I think the approach of just recording every class that we deliver is very flawed and somehow creates as many problems as it solves. Too often we get some of the downsides of recordings, but just end up, uh, you know, delivering and recording the same course uh, the next year anyway. So how about investing to replace or augment the large group teaching with content as effective as some of the best online courses? And I'm mostly thinking here about some of the largest undergraduate lectures that might already have a limited interaction in them anyway. But you know, why not develop support departments with proper production skills and universities to make really engaging content a bit like, you know, some of the best stuff that you find on YouTube um, and, you know, things that can really be used uh, over and over again and free up time uh, for those lecturers to give a more individualised experience to students uh, in, in other ways. Because I really don't think this has to put lecturers out of the job, which uh, which is... You know, one of the concerns that comes up when we talk about this, because they're still going to be managing the courses, teaching parts of it in person, but it really allows them to use their time effectively to provide students with individualised feedback and mentoring, responding to questions in class. Uh, you know, more polished recorded sections could be combined with problem solving quizzes or other activities for a more engaging large group experience, for example. And, you know, there are universities in the UK that have successfully trialled um, using smaller group teaching time for interaction, for collaborative study, research and problem solving. And I'm sure these sort of experiments have been happening all over the world as well. Um, but I'm aware in particular, um, for example, of a course at uh, University of Edinburgh, where they've really embedded these ideas into their assessment structure and also organisationally invested in a staffing and trying something new. And it's really paid off for them. Right. And if you look at new places uh, in, in London here, like uh, there's a Teddy and engineering university that's opening up and a London interdisciplinary school uh, opening uh, in London as well that sort of make the whole undergraduate experience uh, a lot more like the ITTs that uh, we have here at the Samba Doctoral Training Centre at the University of Bath. So, uh, and as I mentioned at the start, um, you know, these are week-long collaborative think tanks where we put all of our PhD students in a room with representatives from industrial partners. And those partners who might be from businesses, government departments or 
related organisations or perhaps even other academic departments at the university here. They, they bring live problems with them that they want to address and the goal of the week is to formulate research and perhaps solve small parts of these problems. So that you know, often leads to mini projects or additional funded PhDs. In my case, even ended up with me assisting with some statistics teaching in Paraguay. But there's no reason we can't make uh, you know, elements of uh, those things sort of part of undergraduate courses as well and really build that into the uh, teaching and the assessment uh, there as well. Has a lot of challenges, I know, but uh, there are some opportunities there too. And so this brings me to my next point. Uh, you know, this approach I think worked really well at Edinburgh and has worked well at other places because they in particular have invested in teaching posts that have equivalent career development tracks uh, to research. And I think in some ways this is, a, this is similar to a, a debate that often goes on in schools that, uh, you know, around whether we should say people who don't take on management jobs are just teachers, right? You know, I, and, I, and I strongly object to calling someone just a teacher. Why can't we have, you know, equivalent uh, positions in schools, and a lot of places have this, where, you know, you can be innovative in your teaching, you can follow something like a management track, but without necessarily having to uh, be a, a manager in the traditional sense, where you can spend a lot more time in the classroom you know, doing the core business of the school, which is, at the end of the day, teaching and learning. So, so I'm thinking of positions in universities where you can eventually have a full professorship equivalent post for teaching. Um, and I think teaching is increasingly seen as important in universities, but it's also still too often looked down on as a secondary activity rather than a complementary one, as it should be. And there are things that can be done as a team uh, as well here that you know re reasonably can't be done by a single lecturer. And I think you know, exceptional teaching in the digital age really does require teams of academic and professional staff collaborating and, and planning together uh, to a high degree and perhaps breaking down a little bit of that um, traditional sort of experience of, you know, every lecturer doing everything all, all, all on their own. Because there's no doubt that creating this sort of content is difficult. And during the pandemic, many universities have made really unreasonable demands on their staff to do things like providing captions and subtitles for every class that they deliver. And it is vital to make accessible content. But there are also a lot of very cost effective solutions. For example, there are a lot of AI driven uh, transit transcription services and you know as I gave this talk at the University of Bath you know even just within Microsoft PowerPoint you know I could get a pretty good live transcription of uh, the talk and here on YouTube I'll upload this video and there'll be automated captions they won't be perfect but they'll be good and again within a university within a school as long as you sort of professionalize that and don't make every teacher and lecturer do it all themselves you can come up with a very good uh, sort of product there um, pretty cost effectively. But unfortunately too many universities have been tempted over the last years and decades by false economies and have actually moved away from providing support staff to academics at a time when they're needed more than ever and that's not just a result of uh, decision making in universities of course that's also a result of funding and finance pressures but it is something that we should think about. Um, and there are also some exceptionally good and efficient online assessment tools out there that have been developed specifically for mathematics. Um, these are really aimed at universities rather than schools, but things like Stack at the University of Edinburgh and Numbers at Newcastle, these can significantly reduce the burdens on lecturers and allow them to create you know, innovative, individualised content in a relatively efficient way. Now, I don't think online teaching changes the fundamentals of good teaching in the most important respect, but there is a lot that we can learn here. And it's a great opportunity here to use this moment where we're all focused on these ideas to prepare for the future, not just this year, but in a much longer term, and to really think about how we're going to be delivering uh, teaching and learning and making that as good as possible uh, in the coming decades as well as the coming years. So I hope this has been at least a little bit thought provoking. Some of the ideas I've talked about today I've had for a while, uh, and some actually are a result of attending this uh, Talmo Teaching and Learning Mathematics Online uh, conference uh, recently. Now I gave this talk in July originally and did have a list of up upcoming events uh, on this slide but unfortunately they've all happened but they have actually got a lot more upcoming events and as this is going to be on YouTube forever I suppose uh, you know I, I would recommend you go and have a look at their website and see what they've got coming up. Um, but there's some excellent events uh, you know and I think if you'd like to think about these ideas more I'd really encourage you to uh, look at what's going on there and perhaps attend some of those again they don't know I'm making this video, this is not a sponsored video or anything like that. They're just a good organisation doing interesting things. Um, and we can think about, uh, you can use those to think about how to prepare for teaching next year and beyond. So that's it for now, but please do 
Put in the comments any thoughts you've had on any of this, things you think I've missed. If you're teaching this year, I'd love to hear what you've decided on, or if you're a student, uh, how online uh, teaching is working out for you. If there are a lot of comments and questions, I might also do a follow-up uh, video responding to some of those. And if you haven't already, please do also consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Uh, most of my content is currently about GCSE and A-level maths, so do share it with any people that you know studying uh, or teaching that. But there might also be a bit more of this sort of content uh, around too, if things go down well. So that's all for now, um, and uh, hopefully I will see you soon.